praise team, thank you. You can go now. I guess I now have a global ministry. I have people coming to hear me preach all the way from Germany. Everybody say hello to Emily today. She is an exchange student. She is so sweet. I've got them coming from Paris, Tennessee, <laughs> Athens, Alabama. Come on, somebody. <laughs> International ministry today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Going to work quickly. I'm cognizant of time today. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. While you're turning there, a very special friend of mine will be ministering this evening. My friend, Brother Faber Nicholson from near Cookville. If you've heard him preach, he is a apostolic wow man. You, you're not going to miss him. He's, he, uh, today is his, I think, 23rd anniversary of pastoring the church that he is in. And uh, the only Sunday a year he doesn't have evening services this Sunday night. And so for the last several years, he's come and preached for us. And so we're looking forward to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. The Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, I like to expand that and say mankind. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will. With the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Today, just a very simple thought, looking at falling and looking at our balance and being able to stand today. Uh, I was taught in Bible college never to give you a sermon title in the form of a question, but there's other rules I've broken too, so it's okay today. The question is, I'm okay, but am I? Am I okay? Am I okay? I'm okay. But am I okay? Who's ever said I'm okay, but then you begin to think, am I okay? I, I'm going to make it, but am I going to make it? I want to preach today from this passage that you can be okay. Jesus today. God, see your people. God, know their heart. Help them today to receive a word of encouragement and edification. God, that your word is not designed to tear us down, but it's to build us up. God, it's not to distract us, but it is to encourage us today. God, that you are the source of life. You are the giver of everything good, and you are able to complete in us that which you started today. Help your people, God, to be fed and our souls to be stirred. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say amen. If you're so inclined before you're seated, would you shake somebody's hand and say, I'm glad you are here today. Amen. Y'all cutting into my preaching time. It's okay. Just kidding. It's been almost 18 years ago that Julie's father at near 70 years old, extended his 32-foot ladder against a wooden, we would call him a telephone pole, but he really just had a light on the top of the pole. The bulb had burned out, so he was climbing the ladder outside his house to change it. Once near the top of the ladder, he stretched his arm out 
to replace that bulb, and he heard a loud snap. The pole his ladder was leaned against had broken off at the ground level. See, it looked okay on the surface, but below the surface, there was rot. When he put the weight of his ladder and the weight of his person against it, it snapped. He had a split second to respond to this unexpected situation. Just like that. He jumped, pushing himself away from that falling pole and ladder, trying to avoid being struck by either. He landed hard on the bottoms of his feet, but his momentum caused him to topple over, and he began to roll down the hill away from the house. Believe it or not, he was able to get up. I can still see those blue coveralls that he wore when he did any sort of project. And he walked into the house, and I think probably still in shock, he told Julie's mother what had happened. And then he sat down in the recliner to regain his composure. It wasn't long after sitting there, the shock wore off and the pain became very, very real, intense. It became obvious that it was going to be necessary to go to the emergency room. After a complete exam and x-rays, it was confirmed. He had cracked several vertebrae in his back. Specialist was called in. A course of action was determined. They decided to inject a very special two-part epoxy cement into the cracks of the vertebrae to fuse or weld them back together. And just like that, he said, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Everything's fine. It's going to be okay. In classic engineer fashion, he calculated for me sometime later the exact height from which he fell, approximately 27.5 feet. He even estimated the amounts of PSI, pounds per square inch, of pressure he experienced as he fell. And after the treatment, he said, but I'm fine, I'm okay. If it wasn't for several weeks. One Friday morning, Julie's mother began to notice that her husband was dragging his left leg. Then his speech became slurred. Couldn't quite understand what he was saying. See, he thought he was okay. Pain had been alleviated. But with the PSI from the fall, what they did not know, because the specialists were only looking at the points that he complained of pain, that the pressure caused a vessel in his brain to develop a leak. And over the days and weeks after the fall, even though he seemed fine, it finally manifested when enough blood pulled up in his skull and began to put pressure on his brain, affecting his motor skills and his ability to speak. Because of the pain, it was obvious that the things in his back had been addressed. But the leak of fluid in his brain began to affect his walk and his speech. We are here today. Some of us could admit that although we live through the situation of the moment, the effects of our previous fall still weighs on our thinking. It affects our walk with God. We know what the Bible says, that whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But oftentimes, because of our previous fall, the enemy wants to weigh on our mind and affect our walk with God. We know that the Bible says those who are born, there are new creatures and we've received a new name and we have an inheritance. But some days... The words that come out of our mouth 
are not coming from the promises of God, but they are coming from something from a previous fall that has not been dealt with. We think we're okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm alive. I'm surviving. Today. What is it resting? What snapped? Was it a loss of job? Spouse? A child? You were leaping for your life, just trying to clear the calamity. Salvage the marriage. Repair the relationship. Just keep it together. But it still weighs on your mind. The divorce decree may be final, but the results of that experience still linger with you. The person that violated trust and hurt you may have received punishment by the courts, but in your mind, their touch and their effects on you still affect your walk with God. Today, if we can't be anything else, Could we be honest before God that previous things in life, if we're not careful, can affect our walk with God? The pain was severe, but I'm okay. Everybody else says I'm fine, so I must be fine. But something inside tells me I'm not fine. I'm alive. I'm surviving. But things keep building up in my mind and spilling over into my actions and they affect my speech and they're hindering my walk. What's wrong with me? But if you ask me, I'm fine. Some of you guys are the greatest actors the world has ever known. Some of you come in here Sunday after Sunday and you got it all together and you're super Christian and ain't nothing wrong and I play the part. I want you to know that there's residual effects of life's experiences. I want you to know that God cares about your thoughts and how you feel. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that God was concerned about the way Cain was thinking. He knew that he had ought against his brother. He knew there was conflict there and God came even though he had separated himself from the day-to-day from Adam and Eve, and they were now expelled out of the garden, God was so concerned about what was happening in his thoughts that he came directly and spoke to Cain. And he said, sin croucheth at your door. I know how you feel. I know that your resentment towards your brother is affecting your walk. And I care for you enough that I have left heaven to come to speak to you personally. But the Bible tells us that Cain did not hear or heed the voice of God. He says, am I my brother's keeper? He goes on to say, I can handle it. How many of us leave here service after service and say, I can handle it? But somewhere between Sunday and Sunday, you don't handle it. You you think you handle it, but it handles you. Cain thought he was okay, and he killed his brother. God spoke emphatically to one of the judges. We call him Samson. He had an anointing on his life. He was separated. He had the looks and the image of everything that God wanted for one of his leaders. Yet there was something in his thought processes. The Bible tells us God, through his prophet, tried to speak to Samson. Samson had a syndrome. It won't happen to me. I can handle it. I can dabble in this and it'll be okay. I know that I'm chasing her, but I can handle her. You be careful lying to yourself. Too many people think they're okay and I can handle it. And I'm a big boy, and I've got this thing figured out. I was sharing with a group of leaders recently that when you're younger, you really do think you got it all figured out. When you get 40-plus, you start realizing how little you really know. Samson had it figured out. 
How about the sons of Eli? Eli, the high priest, had two sons. Yet their hearts were far from God. They believed the lie that many of us fall into. Well, just because I'm born into the family, I'm okay and God's pleased with me. Let me tell you what. It's not who your daddy is, and it's not how many years you've attended church, and it's not how much scripture you've memorized. It is, am I obeying the word of God? Am I okay? You can know. We're going to talk about it in a second. The sons of Eli took the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God atoned sins and provided mercy for his people, and they tried to use it as a weapon against their enemy. Do you know why? Because they did not have a good understanding of the things of God. They thought they were okay. They thought they had it all together. And they brought shame and reproach upon their father and the nation of Israel. David thought he was okay. I've already won a lot of battles. I've already got a lot of trophies. I've killed Goliath. And I've now replaced David, excuse me, Saul. And now I have already occupied the land of promise. And I've brought Israel into its golden age. And the Bible says when the time of war came, when kings were supposed to go out into battle, he stayed home. He put it on autopilot. Can I preach for just a minute? Too many saints of God have put their spiritual walk on autopilot. You come in, you know when to stand, you know when to clap, you know when to say amen, you know how to give. And when service is over, very little change. David sent his commanders out to fight the battle. Notice what happened to David in idleness. When he was no longer passionate and pursuing the will of God, that his eyes found the wrong thing. The rich man, obviously in the eyes of humanity, must have been doing very well because he was rich. And Lazarus, because he laid at the rich man's gate, obviously must have done something wrong because I'm struggling, God's displeased with me. And because he's not struggling, obviously God is pleased with him. That is not true. God is faithful no matter what you're going through. God loves you no matter what you are going through. The rich man thought he had the tiger by the tail. He had the world on a string until a day. Just like a telephone pole snapping and hurling Julie's dad down a hill. Death came to the rich man. And it didn't matter what he had done in this life. And he had eaten well and wore nice clothes and gone to all the banquets and cotillions. He found himself in a place that nobody wants to go. It was so bad there that if... Lazarus could just dip his finger in water and just put a little drop on my... How bad must hell be that one drop of water would make it better? Somebody recently said something about borrowing some money, and I said, well, I got about $20 in my pocket. $20 wouldn't buy the time off me to worry about what I owe. That ain't, ain't gonna, $20 ain't going to affect what I need. I said, okay, I'll just keep my $20 in. It ain't going to help you. I just keep it. What are you talking about, Pastor? In physical, carnal, human eyes, the rich man was okay. But Lazarus was not. I'm here to tell you, things can be deceiving on appearance. Because although Lazarus didn't have two nickels to rub together, and the dogs licked his sores because he couldn't afford to go to the clinic, and he had no health insurance, I'm telling you, don't base it on the external. Because the external will lie to you. You better base it on the internal if you're going to live in eternal ways. Here's what I'm saying today. There were ten virgins. They were all virtuous. They all had that in common, that they had separated themselves and prepared for this day. But the Bible declares, Jesus speaking, that five were wise and five were foolish. They were all virgins. They had all separated themselves. They were all looking for the appearance of the bridegroom. They had all adorned themselves. They were all awake. You hear me. 
but they had not all prepared. For five were wise is because they had brought sufficient enough oil to keep their lamps burning. But the foolish were those who did not bring enough to prepare themselves if the bridegroom delayed his coming. What are you talking about tonight, preacher? I imagine when the evening started, all ten of those virgins... We are ready. It's the wedding day. We're excited. This is going to be awesome. But before the night was over, five went and five were left behind. Jesus goes on to say, there are two in the bed. I imagine they both said they're laid me down to sleep prayer. But one was taken and one was left. Two were in the field. They were both working. But just because you're working don't mean you're right with the master. I'm trying to get a very simple point across. Don't base it on what you're doing and what you're going through. You better know that you know that when the trump of God sounds, it don't matter if you've been in church 20 years, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? It don't matter how much scripture you can quote. It don't matter if you know God. Does he know you? Does he have the hairs of your head numbered? Does he have your days ordered? Have you acknowledged him? I love the New Testament church book of Acts. The Bible says Ananias and his wife Sapphira decided to sell some land. They wanted to impress their friends by what big contributions they were going to give to this new church. Do you understand? They thought they were okay. Who could find fault with a big offering? But the Bible says they lied to the Holy Ghost. Pastor, that's an odd story. I can break it down for you at a different time. I'm going to tell you this. They thought they were okay. But when the Spirit of God tried them and realized they had lied, the Bible says they carried them both out dead corpses what are you trying to tell me tonight i made a declaration to this church wednesday night that i'm really good at being able to help you dial in to sin or the situation but sometimes i've not done a good job leaving you with the answers i'm good at framing the question but how do i get out of it if i'm in it today i don't care where you've been first corinthians 10 tells us that no matter where we've been or what we've done We have fallen in our past, and that's wreaking havoc on our equilibrium now. We have vertigo. We don't think we can stand. But my Bible says, having done all to stand, guess what you need to do? Stand there for! I love, y'all thought I'd forgotten about this, didn't you? What is that? Who does it belong to? If it belongs to a lawyer, a lawyer can come here. Oh, if y'all could see the eye roll I just got. Okay, now Lord, get up here just a second. Didn't look good. I think he's grown a foot. You can't hide behind me. Okay, now do your best. I'm going to push you in just a second. I'm going to push you. Just kind of, how would you stand if you knew I was going to push you? How would you stand? What? Oh, I didn't say. I'm coming at right here. What are you going to do? What did he just do? Braced himself. He distributed his weight. I'm fixed to push you. Ready? Okay. See, he was able to. Now, put your feet really close together. Real close. Real close. See, it's easy. To, see, he had to move. His, it's easy. It's easy. But when you begin to change your stance. Now, he's standing there. Don't he look good? But now, watch it. You'll notice his posture change when he gets on the skateboard. Get, get on the skate. Just stand. No, st- put your feet close together. Just no, put your feet close together. No, no, you got to put close together. We're close together. <laughs> now act like you're going to skate. You don't have to skate. Say, what do you do? You can, sh- you can face them. Don't ever put your back to the crowd, son. Okay, get him here. Show him. Show him. See now. See he's kind of leaning over. What is he doing? Getting his center of gravity just right where he's prepared. It, it just a flinch. He can he can pivot. Can you do it? Can you do a three sixty? Okay. <laughs> Take your skateboard and sit down. There you go. He's doing it. They clap bigger for you than they do for me. What are you talking about? I think I'm okay. But are we? Three steps. I'm I'm gonna make it quick. First Corinthians tells us, take heed. That means look for yourself. 
See with your eyes. Perceive. Weigh it out carefully. I drove through a parking lot. I came to the end of the building. There's a row of parked cars here, but I wouldn't proceed out into the traffic coming out across the end of the building because why? I couldn't see. There was a big Titan truck parked there, big old mud gripper tires on it. So in my little bitty Versa, I kind of stopped completely, and I kind of was inching up to see around it. And all of a sudden, the guy in the big old silver Titan truck slammed into me. I'm, I'm sitting there. Stopped. When the police got there, He's trying to tell them, oh, he must have been flying. He flew behind me. Finally, the officer says, I've been working Rex for 15 years. If he'd have been flying through here, he'd have had an indentation and scratches down the side. But it's just a flat push in. You backed right into him. Go sit in your car. You know what? He trusted his mirrors. But even with good mirrors, there's blind spots. You better make sure that you've taken time to look over your shoulder and take a complete inventory of where you're at. Well, I'm keeping up with everybody else. They may be running slow because they don't see the bear that's coming behind them. But if you'll look over your shoulder, you will see there is an enemy pressing down on you, desiring to devour you. You better take heed. To your situation. Guys, it's not if trouble comes. It's when trouble comes. You better take key to how you're standing. If your confidence is in your job, jobs can go just like that. If your confidence is in your health, it can go just like that. If it's in your bank account, it can go just like that. But my trust is not in men. It's not in horses. It's not in army. It's not in presidents. I'm taking an inventory. And my confidence is in the Lord. I want to make sure I'm in a good position with Him. When I'm standing on the Word of God. Number one, we've got to take key. Number two. I like that the Bible says, let a man examine himself. If not, his wife would do it. I always say examine yourselves. And before I get through talking, people are pointing at each other. Be very careful pointing a finger at somebody because you got three pointing right back. Be very careful. Be very careful. Here's what I'm saying. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. Examine yourselves. Whether you be in faith. I have married some couples that I wasn't persuaded they were in love. I think they were in lust. You getting me? Or even in love with the idea of being married. But I'm not sure if they were in love. You better know that you know. Are you serving God just because what he may do for you? Are you serving God because you love him? Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves. If you go back to the NIV, that says, test yourself and see whether you can pass the test or not. Number one, we got to take heed. we got to evaluate where we're at. Guys, I see myself in a 32 waist. But I'm not in a 32 waist. I can go buy a stack of 32 waist pants. And I can say, I believe I can. I believe I can. But when I try them, when Samson shook himself, it was too late when he was tested. He no longer had got spirit. I'm trying to tell you, before you're in harm's way, you better know that you know that you're okay. Because you could be in a wreck going home today And there's not going to be time to confess your sins There's not going to be time to make it right There's not going to be time to forgive You better know Today Examine yourselves I've had doctors Trying to tell me this and that and the other about me I said now doctor I didn't go to medical school But I am an expert on how I feel Don't nobody know me Better than me And don't nobody 
know you better than you. You better ponder and evaluate where you're at with God. See, the world wants to address the pain. That's why drugs and alcohol are such a problem. It's to mask the pain. But God don't want to just address the pain. He wants to address the problem. He don't want you to be happy. He wants you to be whole. God's desire is for you to be all that he has called you to be. Because God would not call you to do something. He wouldn't also empower you to be able to do it. So number one, we've got to take heed. Number two, what do we got to do? Examine ourselves. Number three, Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that if we neglect our salvation, how shall we escape? I want you to know that this one strikes the heart of many people that on the surface they look well. But years of failing to read their Bible, months of not praying a word, sparse in their church attendance, giving in tithes and offerings, has made them spiritually weak. And it will not take much pressure being applied before they can snap. I want you to know that God desires that you be dutiful and not neglect. You've got to take care of your spirit. I went to an altar 20 years ago. Good for you. I prayed last year. Good for you. But what have you done lately? What is the Lord speaking to you? He is not finished with you yet. Here's what I want to say. Romans chapter 8 verse 24 says this. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience Wait for it. Here it is. Likewise, that means continuation. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Put that in English for me, preacher. Here's what I'm trying to say today. Is that it's not who we are. It's whose we are. I can know that I know it ain't about me. It's about yielding myself to him in me. For my hope is not in me being good or being right or being acceptable. My hope is in the Lord. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The word goes on to say the spirit helps us in our infirmities. Anybody here got a hold of some stinking thinking? Anybody here gone through a season where you've been mad at God? How could you let that happen? God, I was doing everything I needed to do and he left me or she left me or my finances tanked or my health went down. I'm telling you, sometimes we think we're okay, but we have infirmities in our spirit and in our mind and God by his spirit. When we don't know what's wrong with us, he is by the spirit able to help our infirmities if our hope, another word for hope there is confidence. When our confidence is in him. Let me give you a, a practicum. When I was in college, I took several semesters of chemistry, and it was okay to be in the classroom with lectures, but then you had to go to the laboratory and test and prove that not only you could spit out the right answers, but then you could duplicate them in the lab. Anybody want some lab work today? I'm so glad you said yes. I said that before you said no. What are you saying? Here it is. Who remembers when Jesus came? His friend Lazarus was dead. And the sisters were mad. You should have been here. This wouldn't happen. They were focused on what had happened, not on what could happen. 
I'm speaking to somebody today that you are at a crossroads because all you can see is what's happened or failed to happen instead of being open to what could happen. In the flesh, we are limited. But in the spirit, with God, all things are possible. It never crossed their mind that Jesus could come and raise their brother. Does thou believe? I believe there's a resurrection coming, what the sister said. He said, I'm not only the resurrection, I'm the life. He is telling them, not only am I about an eternal situation, I'm about your very present help in the time of trouble. I want not only for you to be blessed in heaven, I want you to be blessed here. Now catch it. Anybody here honest enough to admit your emotions has overwhelmed your faith? Because that's what's broken in your mind because of what's happened to you in the past. Obviously, God's mad at me. Nothing good can happen. I've been sinful. God knows who I am. I'm not worthy for him to even call my name. I don't expect you to raise your hands because if you feel that way, you don't feel good enough to even raise your hand. Here's what I want you to know, though. Jesus came, and the Bible says he was moved with compassion, and he wept. Jesus wept. But he did not let his emotions supersede his confidence. He said, Father, for their sake. And he stood up, wiped his tears, and he said, roll the stone away. Now, can I ask a question? Sister Williams, if Jesus was able to bring life in a body that was dead, could he not spoken to the stone? Sister Carson, could he not said, stone, roll away? But do you know what? God's willingness to work is proportional to our faith. He wasn't going to resurrect a man if the people didn't have enough faith to even roll the stone away. I'm telling you, God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. But if you will obey him, if you will create an opportunity in your life, I don't care where you've been. If you'll open your mind today and say by the Spirit of God, I'm going to put myself in a position. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And then I'm going to trust that God. The part of my faith that has been weak. The part of my faith that is almost dead. I've given up. I don't think I'm ever going to get the victory today. If you'll open up your heart and you will raise your hands, I'm telling somebody that God is going to speak to your circumstance. If you will roll back the hard heart of unbelief and say, God, I believe I'm going to allow you to work. Jesus said, Lazarus. He got on his knees. He begged. Somebody stop me. He didn't, the Bible doesn't say he got on his knees, doesn't say he begged. He just spoke the word. Lazarus, come forth. Y'all got it? That's what the Bible says. Lazarus come out with the bunny hop. Now I'm gonna ask a question. Ramona, Jimmy's funeral. Cemetery. If I'd have said, hey, y'all, take that headstone off and I'm going to speak a word. If Jimmy had come out of the ground, wrapped in grave clothes and doing this, I'd have felt vindicated. Hey, y'all look at me. Right? Right? What are you saying? See, Jesus wasn't happy just to be vindicated that he had the power over life and death. Because it wasn't about him. Jesus says, loose him. I'm trying to tell you today that it's in the mind of God at all times, not just to call you forth and for you just to survive and live. He wants you to be set free. He wants you to be loosed. He wants you to have victory. He don't want you to be happy. He wants you to be whole. Would you stand to your feet today? Me and Sister Caban are okay today. You know why? Because we know we're going to see him again. We're going to see him again. We're going to see him again. What are you talking about today, Pastor? I'm trying to tell you, don't just think you're okay. Just don't think you're okay. You better know that you know. You better take heed. You better examine. Lest you think you're standing and the enemy come and blindside you and knock you off your feet and you lose your soul. What if you lose your kids and your grandkids? What is your soul worth? It's worth everything to God. 
Sister Beth begins to play a song, I'm going to ask you today. Not a glamorous message, but I can take you to right to where I was standing when the Lord spoke to me. He said, put back what you've been working on. Tell them to make sure they're okay. Make sure they are taking heed to their circumstance. Tell them that today is the day of salvation. She begins to sing, I'm going to ask you, would you begin to open your heart? Would you begin to move forward and ask God, God, to speak life to your circumstance? The part that you never thought you could overcome or forget, would you give it God today? Would you allow Him to speak to your circumstance?